remember when we were talking last couple of times and we said that one of the things that's kind of tricky about doing the geology is you've got a piece of rock. And not only is it a physical chunk of material sitting there, but it's also an interval of time. It took time to make that rock. And we think of time in two very distinctly different ways. One is relative time, which is what we're going to talk about today. And that's nothing more than putting things in order. What came first? What happened second? What's the spatial relationship of these rocks to each other? And by doing that, we know the chronologic relationship time-wise. So we're going to talk about relative time. The other part of time is absolute time, which we'll talk about next lecture. And this is where we can look at specific techniques to go in and actually assign an age date to that particular rock. You can tell how old it is, when it was formed, plus or minus a few years. There's a little you know, error in the, in the system, and we recognize that error. But we'll talk about how good are those dates. What do we base it on? How do they work? And why do we have faith in them? So that's kind of what we'll talk about next time. But this time, let's talk about relative time. If you think of relative time, it would be like walking up to the parking meter. And instead of the parking meter saying, you get an hour for a quarter, it would say, put in more money, and we'll give you some more time. It's just relative. There's no sense of an absolute amount for an absolute time. It's just saying, give me more, I'll give you more. That's relative time, essentially. And that was really how the first geological time scale was put together. We just looked at all the rocks around Earth and looked at how they were related to each other, how they stacked up one on top of the other. And we could break them into groups based on fossils and rock type. And we could get a sense of all of the events that happened around Earth time by time by time. And what we've seen is we have this Precambrian area that represents almost 80% of Earth's time. A period when those rocks have been so abused, so old, re-metamorphosed, just crunched up, remelted partly. I mean, the original textures and the original information that those rocks gave us has all been highly altered destroyed in a lot of cases. So I have a little problem figuring out the details of the Precambrian, although we're getting better at it. And then we have the uh, Phantom Zoic. And notice the ending, Zoic. That's biology, isn't it? That means living organisms. And we break that into the Paleozoic, Paleo being old, Mesozoic being middle, and Cenozoic today. Yeah. So these three eras are going to be important to know. And the periods from the Cambrian to the Permian and the Paleozoic, the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and the Mesozoic, and then the epics of Paleocene, Pleocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and recent in the Cenozoic you ought to start memorizing those terms and become familiar with them. Uh, it will show up on exams either in the lab or here in lecture as to uh, you know, understanding the geological relative sequence. So start kind of working on it. I'm not going to scare you with an exam tomorrow, but uh, you know, coming up our, our next couple of exams, you might start seeing some. But well, we did a pretty good job putting this together because we had no idea of the actual date, the age of the rocks. We were just trying to get things in order. And there is no place on Earth where all of this from Precambrian up to recent is in existence. We just get little bits and pieces of it here and there. And somehow we've got to fit them all together to make the entire sequence. We're going to talk about how do we do that. 
It's not as easy as you think. But we did it right. That's the cool thing. When we got absolute age data, it confirmed that we were in pretty good shape. Now one of the things that one of the things that we did that helped us was the use of fossils. And what we see is, for instance, the pre-Cambrian Cambrian border here between the Paleozoic and the, uh, uh, the uh, pre-Cambrian, this boundary represents a big change in the amount of life on Earth. Before that, kind of at the end of the pre-Cambrian, we were getting some like jellyfish, a little bacteria, and we were just starting to get multi-celled organisms, and all of a sudden, things just explode. The variety of life, the niches, the habitats, all fill with all sorts of different multicellular life. Something happened at that point in time that made life just go nuts on Earth. And we use that, because we can, we can see that in the rocks, from very little fossil evidence to a lot of fossil evidence. And we can see that break in the rock, and we can pretty much figure out where we are. We see that the first fish kind of start showing up here in the Ordovician. So that helps us define that period of time. Plants kind of start showing up in the early Silurian here. That kind of gives us another break. Uh, amphibians start showing up in the uh, Devonian, toward the end of the Devonian, and the Devonian was a period of time that forests and swamps started to occur. And the Carboniferous, which is the Mississippi, Pennsylvanian here, that was a time of swamps and coal formation, and a lot of the coal that we mine around the world is from the Carboniferous period. You can think of it as hmm, coal, Carboniferous, Okay, that's kind of where the name comes from. Permian is a time when everything kind of dried up, uh, soils oxidized, where you had iron oxides, rust in the soil, so all the soils turned red. And it was a very deserty, dry kind of time. And at the end of the Permian, a big event happened that just darn near wiped out all the life on Earth. I mean, it wiped out about 98% of the life on Earth. We were lucky we survived the end of the Permian. But then we move into the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, and what we see here are the first dinosaurs showing up in the Triassic. We see flying reptiles. We see placental mammals. And all of a sudden, now this becomes the age of dinosaurs. I mean, you've all seen the movie Jurassic Park, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. And at the end of the Cretaceous, boom, dinosaurs go away. We have a meteor impact, and it again did a tune on wiping out a lot of the species on Earth. So we know this was a meteor impact. It makes us want to see a meteor impact here at the end of Permian, but we don't have any evidence for it. Makes sense, but now we move into no dinosaurs after 150 million years. So now the new life forms that can appear and evolve are way different. That's where we start coming in as mammals. And now we don't have dinosaurs keeping our numbers down. We start to populate all sorts of niches. Grass line, grasslands come in here, the Eocene Oligocene. So the early ancestors of horses start to show up. Uh, whales come in here about the Miocene. And Pleistocene, it's the big ice advances. Now, there were other ice advances earlier on, but the Pleistocene is the one that has left most of our landscape in Michigan. It's changed a lot of landscapes all over the world. But this was a period of time when ice sheets came and went, came and went and their uh, magnitude and their cyclicity uh, became much more apparent. Before, in all of geologic history, we only had four or five periods of glaciation. Now we were getting them every few hundred thousand years back and forth. We're just in between glaciers right now. So what we're basing our geologic time scale on 
is the differences in these rock packages, and a lot of the differences in these rock packages were the conditions on Earth at the time, which is not just changing the type of rocks that are getting made, but it's also changing the life, what can survive, and the fossils, the remains that have been preserved of that life are in those rocks, and they help us put everything in order and hook everything together. United States Geological Survey, USGS. I'm just going to say USGS from now on, okay? So remember what that stands for, United States Geological Survey. They are really kind of the preeminent geology group in the United States. And the survey does all sorts of things. It's first director was James Hall, who was a noted state geologist in New York. He came up with a lot of the early ideas of how rock units fit together. Its second director, the one that saved it from all the budget cuts, or almost went away in its infancy, was a guy that was a product of the Battle of Shiloh during the Civil War. A guy by the name of John Wesley Powell. He turned out to be a giant. John Wesley Powell was Battery F, 2nd Illinois Artillery in the Battle of Shiloh was one of the early battles uh, on the Western Front of the war. And uh, it was uh, just a mauling. The Confederates surprised the Union in camp and just about drove Grant and Sherman back to the Tennessee River. Their backs were along the riverbank. They were waiting for reinforcements. And the first day at Shiloh was one of the bloodiest days of the Civil War. Reinforcements came up. They fought off to a, basically a draw. Confederates retired from the field, but not after nearly 25,000 casualties on each side in three days. One of the survivors of Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, which was another horrifically bloody day, said, you know, I was, I was scared making that charge, but I was at Shiloh and I was a lot more scared there. So it was a bad day. And John Wesley Powell was manning his field piece in command of his battalion, had his arm up, ready to say fire, and he was hit by a musket ball and ended up losing his arm as a, as a war wound. That's what you call a lucky wound. It's enough to send you home and you can get out of the army and you don't have to fight the rest of the war. And he didn't die. But John Wesley Powell, as soon as he could, went back to his unit and fought through the rest of the Civil War, including a lot of major battles. He was that kind of a guy. And after the war, the Union and the Confederacy, well, the Confederacy not so much so, but the Union had this problem of how do we pay our troops? We promised them money for fighting, and gee, the war's over, but we don't have a lot of money left. We spent it all on the war. So they said, you know, we've got all this public land out west. We'll give them some land. So they decided, okay, first of all, we need to go out and survey all this land so we know what we've got. We need to you know, lay it out so we can give them legal title to their parcel of land. And this spurred on uh, a number of big geological and geographic surveys over the next 20 years. John Wesley Powell uh, led a couple of those surveys. And he was famous. In fact, in 1869, just four years after the end of the Civil War, he was starting a major league survey of the Grand Canyon area, and he was the first to go down the Grand Canyon in a boat. Now, here's John Wesley Powell. You'll notice he has one arm. And they were going through like class five rapids. There. You know, the dams weren't on the, the river yet. Things were all natural, and those rapids were a major league. And they were using these double-ended boats, wooden boats, nothing real fancy. And all oared by hand, of course. 
And the way John Wesley Powell did it was he put a chair in the middle of the boat, lashed it down to the boat, and then lashed himself into the chair. And that's how he went down the river through the rapids. Wow. <laughs> that takes some, some grass. And yet, he was the one that kind of really set American geology at the forefront and astounded the geologists of the world because this is what they were seeing. For the first time, geologists were looking at rocks that just kept going on, on, and on. Then you could see how everything looked together. You were down in this valley looking up at the cliffs and you could follow the rock units for miles. Almost nowhere else on earth could you do this. Before this, we were you know, a little bit here, up oh, there, brush covering this. Oh, let's see, that fits with this. And oh, these fossils are like these fossils, so I think that fits together. And now all of a sudden, we could actually see the rock stratigraphy. We could see how the rocks laid out. And you can see here, here's the color picture of this area. And you can see here's the supine group of rocks right here. The Hermit Shale is this area in here. You can see the Coconino Sandstone is a straight cliff. The Toroweep is kind of this area in here. And the Kaibab Limestone is this up here. And you'll notice you get different angles to the cliffs. This Coconino Sandstone is a good, hard, solid rock. It's cemented. It's quartz grains that are cemented with quartz. It's a real tough stone. So it will withstand breaking and cleaving, and it'll stand almost straight up and down. But this hermit shale is real weak. It's just little layers of, of clay that have been compressed and compacted and re-cemented into shale. And when it weathers and breaks apart, it can't withstand a lot. It just kind of crumbles and trickles down to the base of the slope. So it ends up having a very gentle angle. What we call an angle of repose, angle of rest. You can see the supai group, it's a lot straighter like the Coconino sandstone, but here we're looking at some limestones that are pretty indirect. Same with the Kaibab limestone, totally muddy, limey sediments that have been compacted into rock. And again, it acts more like the shale. So you can almost start getting a sense of what the lithology, the rock makeup is, just by looking at the slope of the rock as it goes into the valley. The hard, indurated, solid rock is going to keep a steep slope or a vertical slope. And the soft, crumbly stuff is going to have a gentle slope. So just, man, there's a neat rule of thumb. Without even going up to know what the rock is, you can kind of get an idea just by looking at the slopes as to where it's going to fit in the scheme of things. For instance, here we've got some limey uh, shales. And you can see that they weather back and leave just one little gentle slope after an X. And this whole thing slopes backwards. But look at it. It just goes on and on and on. These rocks just laterally continuous throughout the area. The other thing you'll notice is they're all pretty much flat line. And that leads us to the very first rule of stratigraphy. Number one, original horizontality. When we're looking at rocks, we generally assume that their first formation is as horizontal flat units. Now, that's not always completely the way it happens. But for sedimentary rock, generally, uh, they're pretty flat on the large scale if you look at them on a regional basis. So original horizontality. Another part, our number two rule of stratigraphy, is lateral continuity. 
just like in that last picture, we saw how this stuff just goes on and on and on, filling the basin, forming this sediment that's going to become rock. It fills the basin basically from one side to the other. It's laterally continuous. <coughs> Now, does that mean it's going to be exactly the same? Does it going to look exactly the same from one part of the basin to the other? No, probably not. The physical property of the rock might change due to different conditions where that sediment is being deposited. But it's all being deposited at the same time, isn't it? Let me give you, give you an instance. Here I've got a beach, and here's the sea level. But right along the beach, sediment's being washed in off the continent, the waves are working it back and forth, and I'm ending up with gravels and sands and that kind of stuff. The durable stuff that the waves can't break down very well. What's breaking down are the clays and the, what we call the feldspars. You'll learn more about those in mineralogy. And that material is breaking down into small particles and is being washed offshore. Now the big stuff stays back on the beach. The waves don't have enough energy to move that offshore. They can roll it back and forth, but that's where it stays. But the real fine stuff, the water carries it out into the basin. And <coughs> as it gets out to the basin away from the waves, the energy is even less and this fine material just starts settling out of the water, coating the bottom of the basin. <coughs> so we start to see muds developing out here as these weathered fine grain particles start to settle out. And even further out now, if it's a warm marine area, marine and salty water, and it's clean water, we'll see calcium carbonate precipitate out of the water. So we end up with lime and lime muds accumulating. So if you look at this surface right along the top of the sand by the beach, the clays offshore and the limestone carbonates offshore, that kind's a timeline, right? That's today. Everything along that surface is a single solitary today time. And yet, look how the physical property of the materials has changed from sand to clay to carbonate all along that timeline. So the physical property of the rock is changing despite the fact that it's all the same unit, it's all occurred during the same time, and it's laterally continuous across the basin. So on one side of the basin, I might see limestones. On another part of the basin, I might see sandstones but they're part of the same unit. Ah, that's one of the tricks to hooking everything together. Now, as sea level rises, what's going to happen to my beach? Sea level's going up, now it hits the land back here. So I'm going to see my beach move toward the land as the water encroaches and floods over the land surface. So my beach area now is going to move toward the continent. The land. That means my beach is going to move in that direction. The water's deeper out here. The clays that are accumulating, they're going to follow the beach. And the carbonates are going to do the same thing following the clays. So what's happened here is if I were to look at my vertical section down here, I've got sand at the very bottom. And now as I go up, I've got clays on top of the sand. And if the sea level kept rising, eventually these carbonates would be here, and that would be the next thing that I've seen in sequence. So here's the, one of the tricks that we use to hook things together. I know I've got the sand, shale, or clay, and carbonate, or limestone sequence laterally. Here I've got the sand, clay, eventually limestone sequence vertically. So I don't need to map all of this in a long lateral that I can just look at one little section right in here and I know what to expect. 
And I know because the shale overlies the sand, carbonate overlies the clay, that it's a rise in sea level that's causing this. It's what we call a transgressive sequence. Because it's transgressing over the land. Okay, isn't that a cool trick? I mean, here you can equate the lateral continuity of the rock to the vertical section. So you can kind of get an idea in just a little area as to what's going on in a big horizontal area. Let's say sea level drops. Just the opposite. The shore's going to move back out toward the basin, isn't it? The water's going to withdraw from the continent. The beach is going to shift back. And as it shifts back, the sand, you know, the clay will shift back, the lime will shift back. And then what I see is just the opposite of my sand shale carbonate that I had during the transgressive phase. Then I see just the opposite from the bottom with carbonate overlaying by clays, overlaying by sands. Just the opposite pattern. And I know that was formed by a drop in sea level or what we call a regressive sequence. So it's really cool the way you can just take a small vertical section, figure out how the sea level is changing by the way the rocks stack up. Look at all that information you got out of it. Uh, just a little bit of information looking at the rocks. Our big third principle is what we call cross-cutting relationships. <coughs> 